Okay, welcome tonight. Uh, welcome all of you that are students in the class. It's always great to see you and have you here, and welcome to all of the guests. Uh, just one quick announcement before we start. Um, March 1st, Wednesday, March 1st, we'd schedule to have Sawyer Hemsley from Crumble Cookies come. He is coming for sure, but he's not coming on that date, okay? So he had a conflict. He'll be in Europe. He's going to come. Uh, we had an extra date open in the schedule, and that's going to be uh, April 5th. Wednesday, April 5th, will be Crumble Cookies with Sawyer Hemsley. It's going to be awesome. We might even have free cookies for everyone with the ice cream. So uh, next on the 1st, we'll be here next week. Uh, the speaker is the Salsa Queen, and she has just a phenomenal story. Um, uh, they just informed me they're going to bring some samples, so we're going to be able to eat some of that salsa that night. So next week, come and bring your friends, whoever you want. And then March 1st, we won't meet. March 8th is spring break, we won't meet. March 15th, we don't ever meet the week after spring break, so we're going to have a three-week break. We will have had six of the lectures, and then starting on the 22nd of March, we'll have the remaining four lectures. Okay, so it's the 22nd, the 29th, April 5th is Crumble Cookies, and then the 12th is our final Shark Tank night. So you get a break. We still get our 10 lectures in. We're thrilled tonight to have Jess Larson here, a phenomenal entrepreneur and a good friend, and we're going to let uh, Logan introduce him and then turn the time over to Jess. Awesome. So I'm going to give, a, like you said, a quick intro for Jess. Um, so Jess Larson founded the Greystoke Group, a holding company that owns three businesses. The first, Greystoke Investments, is a commercial real estate fund focused on one-of-a-kind Airbnb, Airbnb resorts for action sports um, action sports families near snowboarding mountains, surfing beaches, and national parks. The second, Greystoke Advisors, is a management consulting firm with special operations soldiers who teach leadership classes. Excuse me. The third, Greystoke Media, makes videos and podcasts for some of the largest media companies in the world, as well as for CEOs and investment fund managers. Just completed the Harvard Business School program on private equity and venture capital before becoming the last CEO, sorry, the CEO of his last investment fund. He also hosts a podcast, The Jess Larson Show, on innovation and leadership, where he's interviewed over 750 billionaires. I think we're closer to 800 now, is what I heard. Um, movie stars, pro athletes, unicorn tech founders, and many other high achievers. Um, but I'll let him tell you about the rest of us, so let's welcome Jess Larson. So uh, this is going to be somewhat more informal. Um, I, uh, as I was getting ready for this, I just thought, what would I want to know if I was back in college right now? And I also thought, like, what are people asking me about all the time? So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Um, <clears throat> what it really is, is a lot of people ask me, like, Jess, how did you get movie stars as clients? How did you get family offices worth several hundred million dollars to be donors to your charity? How did you get Google and Intel and these big clients to be your clients? And so this is really aimed at entrepreneurs in the crowd today. And you know, if you're trying to find clients that could spend a million dollars a year with you, or you think, hey, the business I own in five or 10 years, we might want those kind of clients. Or we're going to need like several million dollars of investment money. Um, how do you actually talk to big investors who might write you a multi-million dollar check? That's really what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so um, quick background on me. Uh, I used to be on a mergers and acquisitions team for Citigroup, and then um, ran, uh, ran the last uh, private investment fund that I had in the energy space. Um, as was introduced, I'm, I'm, our investment fund these days is in commercial real estate. Um, but uh, because of that podcast, um, we just started running into all these great people who would make clients. So um, I was interviewing all these uh, high-profile CEOs and people like that, and it turned into us getting multimillionaires as investors for our real estate fund. And it helped, it helped us get, like I said, Google and Intel and a $16 billion bank and an $11 billion public company to become clients. And um, as enough of this went on, people started asking me, like other CEOs, like, hey, how do you do that? Like, you know, what, what if I wanted to do that? How would this work? So we just started another business called Greystoke Networks, which was saying, like, hey, if you want to meet people like that too, my team who puts this show together for me can put it together for you. 
So we charge these CEOs or investment fund managers like $5,000 to $15,000 a month. And then we line up all these guests 52 weeks a year for them to meet. So we put on some really fancy people on their show and then some of their ideal prospects. And the ideal prospects say yes because of the fancy people who are already on the show. And um, the idea is if they land even you know one or two of these million dollar clients, then they've 10 or 20 times as much money as they spent on us that year. That's kind of our pitch. Um, that's not really what I'm here to talk about. What I'm here to talk about is this idea of like, okay, what if you are an entrepreneur and you've met that investor who might give you the millions or you've, you've got a meeting with that big government entity or that big corporate client that might give you a million bucks this year. Now what? Like you met them, it was good, but it's not like they wrote a check. Like you realize like, we're gonna have to build a relationship. We're gonna have to, they're gonna have to probably get people to sign off. Like, what do I, what do, I do now to actually get them to write that check potentially? Um, so, um, I think about like when I come to talks like this or when I'm watching YouTube videos, I'm a pretty skeptical guy. So it's like everybody's got opinions and I'm like, does this guy actually know what he's talking about? Like, is he, is he just like flapping his gums or has he actually done anything? And so, um, you know, in addition to raising 27 million for my, for my last fund before this one and some of the things I talked about, um, three of the experiences I'm gonna talk about are, are kind of three of the bigger sales that I've made that I think prove this point. Um, and I'll just say this, like there's people who have sold way more than me, um, but all I can do is share with you what I've done. Um, so if you got the chance to learn from somebody who's done more than me, I would totally take, take them up on it. Like you should learn, you should listen to them, not me. But right now all, all you got is me, so <laughs> let's start there. Um, so uh, three of the sales we'll talk about, um, one was a, uh, when I was working in the training consulting industry, um, a client that was going to buy $60,000 of uh, training from us and how I helped them decide they wanted to buy $2.8 million of it from us. Um, another one is an investor that uh, went from zero to offering to put in five to seven and a half million. And then the last one is a different investor who started from scratch, built the relationship. They, they said they'd test us out with $100,000 and ultimately how I got them to give us $8 million. Um, the, the number one, <clears throat> well, if there's only two things you remember from today, they'd be like, first, um, if you can be radically self-honest with yourself and like ask yourself the hard questions you're not quite sure you even want to know the answers to, and like build a habit of that, that will do really well for you in life. And then the second one for these type of transactions, um, which I call the strategy advisor approach, um, it's this idea of the negotiating table. So, uh, and just a quick time check. Should I go until like uh, 6.45 for questions? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, if you think about a negotiating table, what happens when you go meet with, <clears throat> when you go meet with Intel, when you go meet with some big investment banking firm, when you go meet with these clients who could write you a check for like a few million dollars, it's kind of like you're showing up at a negotiating table and then, and they're sitting on the other side and they tell you what chair you get to sit in at their table. And it's the salesperson chair across from them. And the problem with that is that everything that you say gets put through this filter of like, well, a salesperson said this to me. And it's almost discounted a little, right? No matter what you say. And so this approach that we're gonna talk about today is this idea of not trying to convince people or like what you would normally think about as sales of like, what's the verbal judo that I can use to try and get them to do what I want them to do? Instead, it's this idea of how can I get them to invite me uh, out of the salesperson chair and move to the chair to the, beside it and then the chair beside that and the chair beside that until I've gone all the way around the negotiating table and they've gone like shields down and they're letting me be their advisor on their side of the table, okay? And one of the reasons that's so important is, you know, there's a joke about everything that happens in business. There's two reasons for it. There's the reason that sounds good and the real reason, okay? And uh, my son, when we were driving up here, he's like, Dad, what does that mean? So I'll give you a quick story. Um, I've sold a lot of, I sold a lot of training to special ops and corporates and government people. And the reason that sounds good, that's the reason like that they would tell their peers, like, oh, I think our people would really benefit from this sales training. Uh, I think this would be really good for like our accountability internally. 
But the real reason is their boss is driving them nuts. And they're not allowed to tell their boss to shape up. So they're hoping that if they hire us, that we'll fix their boss for them. OK? Well, guess what? They're not going to say that in public in front of all their coworkers. You have to build a lot of trust before they're willing to tell you, like, my boss is a piece of work. <laughs> and I'm hoping you can help me with this. Right? They have to trust you're not going to tell anybody. Right? Um, <clears throat> so um, this idea of how that is done is essentially by confusing the client. Okay? Because you came in, uh, you came in to sell them something, like this big million dollar contract, so they, they had you sit in the salesperson chair. And the way we confuse them is we start doing things that salespeople would never do. We start doing things that friends would do. And they're like, oh, well, maybe, maybe this isn't like a purebred salesperson. Maybe I should let them move one chair closer to me. And we're going to consistently do things that, that you know, a regular CEO looking for an investment wouldn't do. Um, so when I talk about this idea of, of the client goes, you know, the prospect, they go shields down, like I'm thinking of like Star Trek or something, right? They go shields down and they let us in. It's like the godfather. You're like the consigliere giving them advice, right? Uh, an example of that is um, one of our, you know, one of my former CEO clients who's a millionaire, they, they um, have an advertising agency, and they really showed me how this is done. They built so much trust with their client. This is a $100 billion tech company that everybody in here would know if I told you their name. And they over-delivered, and they did so many above and beyond things that agencies don't usually do for a client like that that it got to the point that this $100 billion tech company client said to my client one time, uh, and this isn't a, a direct quote, but it's pretty close, okay? But she said, hey, I have several hundred thousand more this quarter for, for new budget. How should I spend it? Well, like, <laughs> that's not usually something that happens in those kind of meetings, right? Where the client's like, hey, what do you want, how do you want to spend my money, right? And the implication was like, you can have all that 400,000 or whatever it was, right? Um, and, you know, similarly, that, that client of mine who, who got her client to say that to her, I did things that a CEO strategy advisor doesn't do. I let her cancel on me all the time without, without giving her a penalty. I helped her write speeches when she won awards. We did all these things that, like, a regular CEO coach doesn't do. And as a result, she talked that $100 billion tech company into hiring us. And that's how we got them as a client. And I don't know if you know, but most businesses are pretty protective over their largest client. They're not just going to hand that to someone else. And for me, I didn't ask for it. I didn't pitch them on it. I just did things that made my client feel like she could trust me with her client, and I wasn't going to make her look bad. Um, so let's talk about this idea of, of doing things that a, a regular sales rep isn't going to do, doing things that this, you know, a startup uh, CEO isn't normally going to do. And the first one is to really learn their business, okay? What I mean by this is <clears throat> most people who are trying to sell something to a big government agency or to a, a corporate, they kind of generally know what this prospect does at work. Um, but what I mean is, like, learn their job so well that you could sit in for them for a day if they wanted to go on vacation. Like, maybe you couldn't cover a whole week. But like you could cover a day. You've, you've interviewed them. You're almost like an investigative journalist, finding out what they do and how it works. Um, you've interviewed uh, other people in their organization. You've read articles. You've, read, you've watched YouTube videos. And you basically are trying to figure, like, how do these people make their money? And how do the internal politics at this company work? And it's really this idea of like you deeply understand what's going on for them. And most people just aren't willing to spend that much time. Most people just want to get their sale and move on. And you get to signal, I'm different. I'm not like all those other sales reps trying to get the million dollar accounts from you. Um, once you've done that, once you've like really dug into what their problems are, I highly recommend helping them with something that doesn't have anything to do with you. Um, look at their problems that really don't matter to you, you're not going to make any money off of, and try to help them with it. Go read articles and email them. Hey, I found an article about your problem, or I found a YouTube video about your problem. Um, use up your own social capital on them. 
call somebody else and say, hey, would you do a favor for this person I just met? Would you give them some advice about such and such? Uh, that's not something they're used to from sales reps. They used to sales reps being like nice on the outside and greedy on the inside, okay? And uh, if you can show up and genuinely try to help them and use up some of your social capital from your friends on them when they're not even a client yet, they're kind of surprised. They're like confused, like what's going on here? Like, I haven't promised this person money. Why are they treating me like gold? Um, it, it works well. Uh, you know, in sales or in investing, a lot of times people are used to having somebody buy them lunch. Oh, hey, I might get a million dollar contract from you, I'll buy your lunch. That's a pretty common thing, right? My recommendation is buy way more lunches than another sales rep. Like, become friends with them. Re like, try and buy them breakfast, try and buy them lunch. Go hang out with them but spend the entire conversation up talking about them and their problems and trying to help them think through strategies of what they could do about it. Um, what's interesting is the more worried you are about them, it invites them to do the same thing. And when you've shown up like five times and you're not talking about you and your service unless they ask you, that's just like, that's not like a sales rep. That's, that's weird. Like this CEO, I know they're trying to get like a $5 million check out of me, but they show up and ask me like how I'm getting more LPs for my fund, limited partners for my fund. Um, <clears throat> those kind of things, they, they get these people who thought they knew who you were to question if they really knew who you were. And that maybe they can trust you to let you a couple more chairs around the table towards them. Um, uh, so I had a, I used to be a client, our, our last investment fund was an energy fund and we used to be a client of Bloomberg. And then after Bloomberg, I realized that's like a really high priority organization that I want to stay in touch with because, you know, their founder has made like $50 billion. They're just super connected. Like this is, this is good people to have on a Rolodex, right? Have a, on speed dial on my cell phone. So I stayed in contact. And my sales rep, uh, we're going to talk about him a little bit later, um, I started treating him like he was a prospect, and we just stayed in touch. And I would call him for no reason and ask him how he's going, what he's working on, and let him brag about what he's doing in life. And um, even after he left Bloomberg, I just stayed in contact. And uh, he ended up getting me uh, the Special Operations Command of the US military as a client. Uh, he had a contact who was a Force Recon Marine, Force Recon Marine, who was doing this innovation program, and he, he called that guy and said, oh, this Jess guy's great. You're going to want to meet him. He can be super helpful um, and put us together. And then with that guy, I started sending him books for free, which is a little dicey in the military. You can only give them gifts that are under $25, but give them as many as you can under $25, OK? Um, I started buying him books. I started having calls and asking about his problems. Uh, I started making connections for him to like other special forces guys and things that didn't make me money. And that turned into him hiring me to bring me over to Nigeria to train the Nigerian Special Operations Command with him. So I brought this client of mine who was a 25-year Navy SEAL, and it was a really interesting experience. Um, besides, it was my first time like sharing a bed with a Navy SEAL, because me and the Marine and the, and the SEAL all had to cram into one hotel room. So that was unique. But uh, uh, besides that, every time we went met, so we were meeting with the head of the Special Operations Command for the entire military for Nigeria. And this Navy SEAL client slash mentor of mine, he would just constantly ask, what's in it for them? And before we met and after we met, every time, because we were there for like 10 days teaching them, uh, he was constantly saying, what's in it for them? What's in it for them? What's in it for them? And it was just like a mindset um, that I have found really helpful with this strategy advisor sales methodology. Um, if you go to lunch with people more times than would be normal, if you call them and try to help them with their problems more, time than, more times than is normal, and you're hyper-focused, like, how could I actually solve this problem for them? What happens is, it invites them to think the same thing. Man, this person keeps calling me and keeps helping me all the time, like, <clears throat> I wonder what I could do to help them. And sometimes their company can't buy what you're trying to sell them. But when, you're, when you've done this much for them, they'll end up telling you. But they might end up giving you a referral. Actually, very often, they'll feel bad that they can't actually buy from you but they'll talk to one of their friends who has the same kind of job at a similar type of company and get you introduced and things like that. So it's just this idea of like, if you're relentlessly thinking what's in it for them, uh, it invites them to start thinking the same thing. Um, here's another one that, uh, 
might not be as common. Maybe if you read sales books, you haven't heard this one. Uh, invite your prospects to do service. Um, if, you, if you call them, like, this is a little dicey because it depends how well you know them, okay? But if you know them a little bit, ask for a little bit. If you're getting to know them quite well, you can ask them for more. But when you call your prospect and say, hey, I've got this other person that has a problem. Would you ever have like 10 or 15 minutes for a quick call to give them advice of what you would do with that, in that situation? I've almost never been turned down. And they're like, again, like why is a sales rep calling me, asking me for free advice for somebody else? Like it's just not something that normally happens. But what happens is you do this phone call and you hop on with the person you're trying to get advice for and your prospect. And your prospect gets to be important. They get to be the one who had the answer. And if this was a good matchup, the person who you got the favor done for is actually like really gracious that you like, you got the head of purchasing at Walmart to take a call about this. And this was so helpful and thank you so much. And at the end of that meeting, your prospect feels really good about themselves. You know, society tells us like, if we get more money, we'll be happier. If we get more famous, we'll be happy. If we get all the cool stuff, we'll be happy. But really like that stuff's just fun. It's not like lasting happiness. Like, Genuinely helping other people is where you get more lasting happiness. So if you can help your prospect do service for somebody else, they get to have this really great feeling, and you're the one who helped them get that. It's kind of a counterintuitive thing. Most people aren't asking their prospects for anything except the check, but I recommend it. Um, here's another one, accept invitations. Um, uh, I'm going to tell you about a story of like <laughs> going on a semi-bromantic trip <laughs> to a beach house in North Carolina with a client, okay, because they were like, we were talking about vacations and cool stuff to do, and they were bragging about their beach houses. Like, That's amazing, I'd love to see that sometime. And he's like, oh, you should come. And I was like, I'd love to. He's like, he's like well, you could come stay at our place. And I was like, don't, don't tease me. Like, I'm the kind of guy that'll take you up on that. And I was like, kind of challenging him. He's like, I mean it, let's do this. And like, after knowing the guy 45 minutes, we had this trip booked <laughs> to Myrtle Beach. I'll tell you more about it, okay? And I, I knew people in common, and it wasn't, it's not quite as creepy as it sounds, okay? But I'll tell you what, um, I'm still friends with that guy today. He just texted me uh, uh, a few months ago and put us in contact with somebody else for our uh, charity for Child Rescue. Um, I'll, I'll tell you that story in a few minutes. Um, but uh, the, the Bloomberg guy who got me the Special Operations Command, you know, he invited me to come stay at his brother's cabin in Vail and go snowboarding. And it like, wasn't convenient. I wasn't going to Vail otherwise, but I took him up on it. Another time he invited me to come stay at his family's lake house in kind of central New York um, when I was going out to the city for something. So I took him up on it. And it was like, it, it was, it's just not a common thing. Like sales reps usually don't do, go do sleepovers. Okay? So uh, obviously, you got to be smart. If you don't know someone very well, that's going to be really awkward. right? But my point is, when people offer to lend you something, when people offer to call someone for you, when people offer you something, these prospects of yours, take them up on it. It makes them feel good about themselves. And it's this chance to have extra interaction with them. And uh, for me, what's fun is it, it actually moves beyond the like, investor-CEO relationship. It moves beyond like, the client and uh, salesperson relationship. And these people actually become like genuine friends that I stay in contact with even if they're not going to buy stuff from me. It actually just makes my life better to have good friends. Um, so um, I am like really into audiobooks. Um, I was telling these guys bef before uh, this meeting, I've listened to maybe like 900 or so different books about business and marketing and investing. Um, but that doesn't count like 400 books in the Jason Bourne genre. Like I'm really into like special ops and spies, okay? so. On my podcast, where I've interviewed these like 800 different, you know, billionaires and pro athletes and movie stars and stuff, um, I've had lots of like uh, guys from the classified units of special ops and like 25-year uh, CIA case officers, and they're like telling me these amazing stories about like what it was up, like to go up against like the Iranian nuclear program and like you know, it's, like stuff in the movies, right? I think this is cool. Maybe you don't, but. Um, Something I never thought was as cool until I met these guys was the counterintelligence officers, like at the FBI. They're basically like reverse spies, okay? So their job is to find out like foreign diplomats or foreign spies who are in America trying to steal our secrets and become such good friends with them that they can turn them into a double agent for America. 
okay? And one of these guys wrote a book. His name is Jack Schaefer, and it's called The Like Switch. It's great. And, um, you know, the different guys I know in the Intel community who've, who've been mentors of mine and clients and friends, they talk about how similar recruiting a spy, dating, and sales are in their mind, okay? So we're going to use some dating analogies in a minute. But here's some ideas um, for what Jack Schaefer recommends if you're trying to recruit someone. In our case, we're trying to recruit a multi-million dollar investor or a, a million dollar a year client. So the first one is proximity. It's this idea of can you physically get in the same space as people? You know, Zoom is great. Phone calls are great. You can do a lot with that. But there's just something happens when you're like physically within five feet of somebody that doesn't happen on a phone call. It doesn't happen on Zoom. And so can you make the extra effort? When it's OK to have a Zoom call, can you make the extra effort to get together in person even when it's not convenient for you? But trying to spend time physically in the same room with them uh, increases your likelihood. The next one is frequency. How often does this happen? How often are you having calls with them? How often are you connecting with them, sending them emails, getting together in person with them? Um, the next one is duration. Once you're there with them, how long are you spending? You know, if I can get in the same room with someone, and I can get in the room like once a week with them, but I'm only seeing them for 30, 30 seconds, it's not, it's not a lot of time to build a real relationship, right? When I'm thinking ahead, oh, I'm going to see this person, what could I do that's in their favor to want to spend more time with me? Well, it, it's funny how these like super busy executives can't see you for three weeks until you're buying lunch. And then all of a sudden, they've got an hour this week because they were going to have lunch anyways, right? So, hey, uh, we should get together for a meeting. Oh, yeah. Could you do like 11 or like 1? Yeah, I could, do, I could do 1 on this day. Great. Why don't I just buy you lunch? Like, why don't we do this? Why don't you let me buy you lunch, and then we'll do the meeting right after lunch? And I went from having 30 minutes with them to having 90 minutes with them, right? Um, intensity. Uh, he, Jack says it this way. Intensity is related to the closeness and influence of one's actions and words in relation to the physical and mental needs of the other. One kind of intensity that works very well is to show your curiosity about other people. What he's really trying to say there is like, great, so you're physically in person relatively often for a good amount of time. What are you talking about when you're there? Like, how deep is this interaction? Is it all surface? Is it all logistical? Are you just talking about your accounting? Are you just talking about your accounting software? Or are you talking about what really cares, what this person cares about in life? Like, are they really into their son's uh, fantasy football league? Are they really into their um, like daughter's softball team, um, what matters to them in life? And, and I will say, like, do yourself a huge favor and don't do the cheesy CEO thing where you're like, you get to meet with this super rich guy that might give you a few million or, or this woman who runs a venture capital fund. And you're like, you know, all these books are like, look on their desk and try and see what, uh, see what their interests are so that you can relate to them about something in common. And it's like, oh, you see, like mountain biking. You're like, I've been mountain biking once in my life. So you're into mountain biking. What's that all about? And it's like, it's like an inch deep. And they're going to find you out. Because if they're super into mountain biking, by about like six minutes into this conversation, they're going to figure out, you don't know anything about mountain biking. So my, my uh, preference there is, was like my strategy for um, trying to get cute girls to want to hang out with me in college. Okay, So... I would like, look for the cutest girl at the dance, go ask her to dance, and I called it topic cycling, okay? So you're, you're dancing, and she's like, you know, tolerating you at first, right? And, and so you just quickly start going through subjects. And what I'm trying to do is find something that her eyes light up about that's not going to bore me to tears, right? So I might be talking about, like, what's your major? Where are you from? What do you do when you're not doing school? And I'm like, I'm quickly trying to go through subjects until I can find something that I'm like genuinely interested in what she's got to say, right? And then for like the next like, uh, you know, minute and 45 seconds till the song is over, I'm like really asking her about this stuff, right? And I, and I actually want to know the answers and she can sense that from me. And so afterwards you're like, that was actually really fun. Like I know we just met, but I, I'd love to like stay in contact. You know, like getting her to tell me what building she was in and what her room number was went way up. Right? Um, this is the same thing. Venture capitalists, they, ha they ha like, they're interesting people. Um, don't do some like inch deep thing because you saw it on their desk or you saw it on their LinkedIn before you went and visited them. P.S. Do yourself a favor and go through their LinkedIn, find out where they go to school, 
find out where they grew up, try and find out all the other places they worked in case there's something really interesting there that you want to know about. But um, do yourself a favor and, and topic cycle until you find something that they're really interested in, that you're really interested in genuinely and sincerely. And um, it gives you a chance to talk about something other than work and then for them to find out that you're not just thinking about them as a walking ATM machine you're trying to figure out how to get the money outside of. Nobody wants to be thought of as like an object, right? Um, so um, all these spies um, that I've been lucky enough to meet swear by a book that a lot of business people think they're too good for. Uh, it's called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. It's been a bestseller for like 100 years, and it has some cheesy stuff in it. And that's OK. If you can look past the cheesy stuff, there's stuff that is solid gold. Um, I've been reading it at least once a year for the last 22 years. Some years I'll listen to it five and 10 times during the year. Um, one of my favorite things from that book, though, is when he says, when you look at human needs, like, oh, we need shelter, we need food, uh, things like this, like, most of our human needs are covered. You know, <clears throat> uh, most of us are not living below the poverty line in this country, right? Um, but he says there, there's this human craving to feel important that does not get met very often. It doesn't get met at work, doesn't get met at church, doesn't get met at home for a lot of people. And so if you can be one person in their life that helps them feel important, you're on a really short list. Um, and so uh, there's this idea of what can you be interested in about them? What can you be, what can you be genuinely impressed at that they have accomplished in their life? Um, their, their chance to feel proud of themselves today, like you might be their only person this week that helped them feel proud about themselves and feel this human craving to feel important. And people remember that. And if interaction after interaction, they keep coming away from it like, man, every time I see her, I just feel better about myself after those meetings. They're going to want to see you again. Um, the, the point I'm trying to make here, and hopefully I've said it a few times, but repetition is helpful. Um, this is not a sales trick. This is trying to start a genuine friendship with somebody, whether they buy from you or not. And granted, if they don't buy from you, if they don't invest in you, you're probably not going to spend as much time with them afterwards because you're going to be busy running your business. But this is, <clears throat> this is so different than like, what trick can I use to get them? This is like, how can I convince them I actually really like them as a person? Because I really do. Because I found out enough about them to find something about them that I really do like. Um, it's non-transactional. It's long-term. Um, you, know, uh, you know, we talked about the Bloomberg guy who got me Special Operations Command. So a different one of his colleagues I've stayed in contact with for 10 years. When I would go to Washington, D.C., I'd buy him lunch. Um, probably two or three times a year, I'd just check in on him. Hey, what are you doing? What's going on? What are you working on lately? Just for no reason. I worked on that friendship for nine years. And uh, then he decided he was interested in podcasting. And so I was giving him free advice. And then I offered to do, to do their podcast. So he's at a... Well, he's a Bloomberg. I'm, I guess I'm allowed to say that, okay? One of the biggest media companies in the world. They do not need me to do their podcast editing, right? They've got they have multiple TV channels, let alone shows, right? But I started trying to help for free. And he's like, I got this, I got this. And six months in, he's like, well, that's way too much work. How much does it cost to have you guys do this? And Bloomberg became our biggest client. And that was nine years in the running. Now, I wasn't doing a lot during those nine years. It was the occasional lunch. He moved to London, so then the lunches stopped, and it was just a text message. It was just a Zoom call, right? But it was a true friendship. It wasn't a, how can I get this guy? And so when it came to something he had a real need for that I was a match, you know, it was going to be pretty hard for another media company to get that contract because of the trust I had with him, right? Um, those two guys have a third friend who I've stayed in contact with, uh, so it's like 11 years now. Nothing's ever happened. Uh, he's never bought anything from me. He's never sent me a referral. Um, I don't have any eminent way I'm going to make money from him. But he's just the kind of person that I wanted to invest in. You know, you can't do this with everyone. 
you've got to be smart because you only have so much time in a day. But he's a guy that I decided was going somewhere in life and, was, and that I decided I wanted to be friends with. And um, right now, like just a few weeks ago, I found out he's working for the guy who invented the X Prize. Do you guys remember that thing uh, a number of years ago where you could win $10 million if you, if you could get a spaceship up into space twice in two weeks? Uh, something that NASA couldn't do? So uh, this guy... Um, hangs out with Elon Musk personally, regularly, and my buddy is now uh, works directly with him on an, ev- on an every single day basis, right? And guess what? Nothing might come out of that, and that'll be okay. But because of this long-term, genuine friendship, I have a legitimate shot of hanging out with the guy who hangs out with Elon Musk, right? Um, so uh, we're winding down on time a little bit here. Maybe I'll just share a couple of these stories. So. I had, a, I had left finance and was working for the management consulting firm we used to hire. I went to work for them. And uh, we, we did these leadership seminars and training and workbooks. And so they had this army colonel there with some of his colleagues. And uh, I, I just started working there and I met him. And he said they were going to buy about $60,000 worth of train the trainer and these workbooks. And I thought, that's great. But like, you guys are a huge organization. Like, you have like 175,000 staff. You have like a $52 billion budget in your department. Like, there's probably more potential here, right? So the company I was working with at the time are self-admittedly not salespeople and actually didn't really have a sales program. They just kind of waited who came to them because they had good material, okay? But um, I said like, well, can I have that account? You know, like that afternoon I said, can I have that account? They're like, oh, sure. So I just started doing things that nobody else in the training world was doing. And I like tracked them down. Hey, can we have dinner tonight? Oh, they couldn't. Well, can we have breakfast in the morning? Can I, can I drive out early and buy you breakfast? And then on every breakout, I'm sitting there talking. And it's like I was an investigative journalist. I'm like, so how does your job work? And what do you do? And how do you buy that? And where does this go? And I'm interviewing all his colleagues saying, does this work? So-and-so said that. Is that how that really works? Oh, no, it's like this? OK, great. And then I set up calls. Hey, this is so great to have you guys out here for a couple days. Like, I'd love to co- continue the conversation. Can I call you next week? Uh, by the way, for appointment setting, go from wide to narrow. Say, oh, it'd be great to have a call sometime. And it's very noncommittal. They're like, yeah, sure, sure, Jess. And you say, great. Um, what's your schedule like, like in a couple weeks? Like, is that, is that potential? Yeah, I could, we could probably do it in a couple weeks. Then you pull out your phone, you're like, so like week of the 14th, like, uh, what's good? Like, maybe like the Wednesday or Thursday? And all of a sudden, it's like too late to say, they don't want to talk to you, right? <laughs> They're like, uh, maybe Wednesday. Oh, great. Like, what, what, what time would be convenient on Wednesday for you, right? And all of a sudden, it's like, if you had said, hey, can we talk two weeks from today on, you know, can we talk two weeks from, from Wednesday at 10 a.m.? They'd be like, oh, uh, I don't know, Jess. Uh, let, me, let me check my calendar. I'll get back to you. As in, like, no, <laughs> right? But, but when you start wide and vague, and then you move down, you, you get the appointment. So we have a call. I end up sending them some more books for free. Like, we were selling them books, but I sent them some extras for free. Then I started talking to his deputies and and his employees and talked to them about how the program works and what they need help with. And then they were doing their first Train the Trainer event. So I did what no other salesperson in our company did, or I volunteered to buy my own plane ticket. Well, I had the company pay for it. I volunteered for us to cover the cost to fly me out from Utah to San Antonio to sit with them and just watch and see how it goes and just be supportive. I wasn't getting paid. I wasn't training. I wasn't doing anything like that. And they're like, oh, that'd just be great. Yeah, you know, this is our first time. We'd love to have some help. So I did. I flew out there on our dime and I sat in the back of the room and I didn't pipe up and I didn't didn't try to take over for them, but I got a chance on every breakout to keep talking to them. And I got to buy them a couple more meals and they, like, at some point they're like, Jess, you can't buy every meal. (laughs) <laughs> so they only let me buy so many, right? But I got to find out so much more, and I did something that nobody else was doing. Bought my own plane ticket to come to their thing for free. And so that allowed a bunch more phone calls and sending more books. And then I started looking for articles, and I started looking for YouTube videos about their problems, and I started sending them those. And um, then they said, hey, there's this big event out in D.C. Like, if you wanted to meet, you know, that we're, we're all going to be at, like, if you wanted to come. But, like, they weren't offering to pay me to be there, Right? So I fly out, cover, you know, plane tickets, hotel rooms, all this stuff. And um, the three-star general, who is in charge of the $52 billion budget, her husband, who's a retired colonel, was there at the event. And so because I was hanging out with the colonel and the, the deputies, 
They're like, oh, Jess is great. We should introduce him to the boss's husband, right? So we go to lunch, and, and they had spoken for me, and they liked me, and they thought I was more than a slimy sales guy, right? And so they're willing to bring me to lunch with their, their boss's spouse. Like, this is a, this is a um, high-value relationship in their life, right? If they want a promotion at some point. And at that lunch, we, like, we just start shooting the breeze, and we start talking about the trips and, you know, my, my bromantic relationship, right? So this is where it comes up to the, like, we start talking about beach houses, and, and he says, you could come out sometime, and I'm like, don't offer that. I'll take you up on it. He's like, I mean it, right? And we book, <laughs> we book our weekend. And so again, I'm flying out from Utah, and, um, and he had, by then, he'd, like, read our books. He's like, it, it was really funny, the night before I got there, I'm calling the colonel, and he's calling the colonel at the exact same time, like, what am I getting myself into? Who is this guy that I'm about to spend the weekend with, right? Um, but it was, it was really fun, and it got us, gave us a chance to talk a lot about the material and the books, and he told me what was going on at the highest levels uh, for the three-star general. We ended up talking about his kids, um, and we started like a really genuine friendship. And I have no idea um, if that's duplicatable if anybody here should ever go do a sleepover with a, with a prospect, okay? I'm not recommending that per se, but it's this concept of doing things that sales reps don't do. Well, um, it's not too long after that, that again, without me asking, they came to me and said, hey Jess, we've decided not to buy $60,000 worth of books. We've decided to buy $2.8 million from you. Nobody was more surprised than me, right? But in all these phone calls, I'd been giving them advice about their problems, and I'd been teaching them how our stuff works. I wasn't trying to convince them why to buy our stuff. I was teaching them how to think so they could realize where my stuff would fit into their life. Um, I'll finish off here with, with just two more stories like that. Um, uh, we were working on a real estate deal. Uh, by the way, that story has a, a sad and happy ending. The, there was a government shutdown because of the debt ceiling, so we didn't get the 2.8 million, which is this huge letdown. And then the good part is, because of that relationship, um, my understanding, I don't know if I should share this, uh, my former company is making multiples of that 2.8 million now from that client because of that. So we had, we had a dip and then it came back. Um, the, the client, this real estate client who offered me between five to seven and a half million I bought this guy so many lunches. And like, I really recommend buying people a $50 steak. Like, that's a really good start. But in this case, I just bought him like $18 Chinese food, okay? But I did this over and over. And then I paid for him to come to the Caribbean to come look at the property we were doing. And he covered his own flights, but we covered his hotel and his food. And, and um, I continued to ask him about him and his problems and what he wanted to do. And I asked him for advice on what he thought we should do with this real estate project. But I actually wanted the answer. Like, it wasn't like a gimmick. Like, I actually wanted his advice. And that's when he came back and said, hey, I think I'd like to put in between five million to seven and a half million. Now, ultimately, different things happened. Ended up the guys in Mexico didn't actually own the land they said they owned. We pulled the pro plug on the whole project. But it's the principle that matters. Um, last one here, uh, for our energy fund, I had a client. They thought maybe they'd try us out. Had our first meetings. They said maybe they, so very large fund. They thought they'd put in like 100 grand to test us out. And what we did is repeatedly do things that funds like ours don't do for a fund of funds like theirs. We basically did their job for them. We like would, we would make their quarterly update for them. Like we were like doing graphic design. And I drove, um, we, we went like 18, on an 18 hour drive to northern uh, maybe it was like 27 hour drive to northern British Columbia to go get video and photos so that they would have good content for their, uh, for their brochures that they were giving to their investors. And we were available at a moment's notice on, on everything, like even when it was like unreasonable, right? And we kept making it, we kept making them look good and we kept making it easy to do work with us and they ultimately decided they didn't want to put $100,000 with us, they wanted to put $8 million with us. So um, I'll end there uh, if anybody has any questions. And hopefully, uh, hopefully you got at least one thing out of that. Thanks so much.
done things that you've done? How would, how would I approach that? And in, and in what way would that come together? And, and, the, and then the second question is, you started your career with, with, some, pretty, with some pretty impressive names like Citigroup and some really legit organizations. Do you feel like for you... Can I back up on that? I didn't actually start at Citigroup. I started selling uh, yellow page ads. And I don't mean like the cool big ads. I mean like the inline ads. I sold uh, cell phones. I sold, uh, I did cold calling for a sales training company where I called 100 people a day and I, to try and get two yeses. Um, Citigroup was like the first real job. <laughs> so keep going. Um, it's definitely great because almost nobody asks me about my degree because I don't have a degree. I'm an art school dropout. Okay. Well, at first I was going to be a pro snowboarder, and then I thought I'd be responsible and become an artist. Okay. And then I dropped out to be an entrepreneur. And nobody asks me about my degree because I used to work at City, so they assume that I like went to some Ivy League school. So it's helped me for that. But um, more than anything, it just gave me this like eye-opening experience of like, oh. That's what private equity is, because we were trying to sell companies to private equity firms. I was like, that's like entrepreneurship for somebody with ADD. I've got ADD. Maybe I should have a private equity fund. So it was more eye expanding, like open the aperture more than a launch pad. Uh, as far as the lunch thing. So A, you could have lunch with me. But B, uh, to your bigger question of trying to find folks that, are, that feel like they're maybe a little outside your reach, uh, the best thing to do is try and find a connection. So like, you know, Mike Glazier, Andy here at the university, talking to them and trying to find, say like, hey, could you ask them if they'd have lunch with me? Because I'm going to feel bad saying no to my friends, right? Even if I don't really have time for you, I'm going to feel bad saying no to them. So that's a good hack. Um, if they're famous or if they're too rich, um, it, that's a big ask. You know, like, if, if their time is worth like thousands of dollars an hour, and you're like, oh, I'd be willing to buy $20 of lunch. Like, that's not a great trade for them, right? Um, if they're not famous or they're not super rich, they're going to eat lunch anyways. They'll probably let you buy it for them. Especially if you'll come to them when it's convenient for them. Uh, you're offering to go somewhere they, they want to go. Um, the worst is like, can you have lunch on Wednesday? Well, no, I'm, I'm on a flight, you know. If you're really flexible on when you can see them, they're like, you say, hey, would it be ever possible for me to grab lunch with you? And they say, when? You say, any time that's convenient for you. Um, that's where I'd start. So when you're talking about like, maintaining these relationships throughout the years, like how, how often are you like, keeping in contact with them? It's not like too much of the knowing that's enough to like, say, hey, like, I care about you. And what things are you bringing out with you? Okay. This is another, this is another dating analogy. Okay. So, I was not very um, suave with the ladies in, in high school, okay? And uh, uh, I went on an LDS mission, and I came back and was like, that's it. I'm going to start being bold. I'm going to start being brave, you know, right? And my, my good buddy Chris Paget and I came to the observation that the hot girls don't like a puppy dog boy. They want you to be interested, but they don't want you to follow them around all the time. So having this balance of, like, I'll give you an example, like my wife, okay? So by far, like, way too attractive to consider me. So, like, when I first met her, I was going for, like, easier prey in, in the circle, you know? And then one day, she introduced herself to me. I was like, oh, my gosh, the hot girl's talking to me, <laughs> right? And, uh, and so I, like, you know, did book a meeting immediately, right? <laughs> so, um, so we were going to the UCLA, like, a dance at UCLA. And um, so we tried to, I tried to do whatever I could for, you know, frequency, duration, intensity. Like, I'm trying to find excuses to spend time with her because we had a friend in common. But I knew this, like, the hot girls don't like the puppy dog boy. So at the dance, um, when we, like, because the three of us drove down to L.A. together and we go, I, I waited for them to both sit down, and then I went and sat down on the other side of her friend. And then when the slow dances came up, like, I asked her friend to dance first, right? And... Uh, Funny enough, like she went home and like told her mom, like, "Oh, I don't think he likes me. I think he likes Josie." <laughs> okay, and uh, what's funny is like she was, so she's like really attractive. Okay, <laughs> she had lots of boys falling all over her, and there was just like just enough tension that actually made her somewhat interested. 
So this idea of like, think about it as like a, an, an orchard of friendship trees, okay? Desperation is a stinky cologne. You do not want to bug the same person over and over and over, okay? What you want to do is start a whole bunch, you want to plant a whole bunch of friendship trees. And just have faith. One of these is going to bear fruit at some point. I don't need this one to close. I'm going to talk to a whole bunch of investors. And I just have faith that if, if I'm not a slimy salesperson, if I build real friendships, that somewhere, 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 somebody is going to invest, of our stuff if it's, invest in our stuff if it's any good. Right? So it's this balance of you can't overdo it. You can't be like the needy puppy dog boy who's, who's bothering her. And like, she, now she's like, is this guy a stalker? Right? You, the way you get away from that is you just, you're trying to plant as many trees as you think you can actually keep up with. You're not just texting the same person over again three times a week, right? Um, and just face it, you're going to get it wrong. You know, like I have this client who's like a, in one of the class, classified units of special ops. And he told me afterwards that like I was like the creepy guy at one point when I was like offering to give him passwords for this system of ours that I'd paid for that I didn't know well enough. He's like, that's just weird. <laughs> He's like, I'll tell you that now. But like that was too much too early. Right? You're going to make mistakes. That's OK. But you don't need them all to work out because you've got so many friendship trees growing. I don't know if that's helpful. Sorry, the po my podcast episode with who? Um, um, David Alvo. Oh, David Alvo, yeah, from Chile. Yes. So I, I realized that he's involved with multiple cultures, and because of that, he's actually really good at the Spanish language. Yeah. And he's also really good at the Okay, so the question was about ADD, and you get told you'll make more money if you focus, but like, I've got multiple companies. This, this guy from South America who's on my podcast built a billion, you know, billion dollar company, first investor in a billion dollar company down there. He's got multiple companies. Like, how does that work? So the first thing I tell you is don't do what I did. Like, I was trying to start five companies at the same time. That's like, that's a terrible idea. Um, we were talking about this great book earlier called The One Thing by Gary Keller, the self-made billionaire who did Keller Williams where he says, like, think about it like dominoes. Like, what's the one thing I could do now that would make it easier to get to the next domino? Because the physics of a domino is it can knock over a domino that's 50% larger than itself, right? So don't do what I did and try to start five at once. Um, basically, what I found is the less I do, the more money I make. So if you think about these businesses, if I try to do them all at once, probably none of them will work, or they'll be like just barely hanging on. But if you do one and get it to the point where I can hire such high quality people, they might actually be better at my job than I am. So I can get my time back to do the next one. That's how it becomes realistic. Um, I know we're about up for time. Anybody got one last one or should we call it? Yeah, so uh, it's a lot about, it's mostly about uh, leadership training and getting radically self-honest and asking ourselves about our own leadership blind spots and kind of like um, looking in the mirror at the things that maybe we don't want to see. And that once you do that for yourself, uh, you've got a lot more street cred to ask your staff to do the same thing. And if you start getting an organization where everybody's calling their own fouls, all of a sudden this is a lot better place to work. All of a sudden, our clients like working with us better. And, um, and uh, it's just a recipe for success. And then it's a lot from these other books and these you know, people I, I interview. Like One of my favorite books of all time is called The Talent Code. It's about how experts become experts the fastest. Um, and we, say, we, we talk to them about how can you get good at your job faster. Um, but it's, it's really about like high performance teams. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I think we're good.